Hello, everyone joining us today. Uh, happy awareness month from the Arizona Department of Water Resources. I want to quickly remind participants to mute yourselves during the presentations so we can hear all the presenters. We will have time for questions at the end. So during that time, I would encourage everyone interested in asking something to unmute themselves or ask their questions in the chat and I'll be reading them for you. My name is Nemesis Ortiz and I am the Drought and Conservation Coordinator at the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Um, just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared through the Arizona Department of Water Resources YouTube page for those who missed it. I will provide a brief Water Awareness Month introduction and then we can continue with the presentations. So the Arizona Department of Water Resources and our water conservation partners from around the state invite you your family and your neighbors to join in the celebration of Water Awareness Month, or WAM, as we like to call it. Uh, the Water Awareness Month website was first launched in 2011 and is overflowing with ideas and activities to help you learn more about water conservation and become more aware of our state's most precious resource, which is water. The availability and quality of our water supply is critical to our quality of life. Therefore, this essential and precious resource was recognized by Arizona's governor in 2008 with an executive order that designates April as Water Awareness Month. Many thanks to Arizona's water awareness partners from around the state who contribute events, tips and resources to the website and help promote water awareness. And here are our speakers for today in this USGS Hydrologic Science to support Arizona's water management decisions webinar. Uh, we have Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a geographer with uh, the USGS Arizona Water Science Center. He has a background in aviation, remote sensing, and USGS stream gauging techniques. He works with a small team of talented hydrologists at the USGS, developing and implementing tools to improve data collection and analysis with the goal of improving daily operations as well as providing timely information to stakeholders and cooperators for monitoring and decision making. We also have Jim, who worked, um, joined the USGS Arizona Water Science Center as a hydrologist in 2000. From 2000 to 2007, Jim worked on three projects in the upper San Pedro Basin. The first was to quantify the groundwater and surface water requirements of the riparian vegetation and the second was to quantify stream aquifer interactions as part of the groundwater model development. Follow these projects. Following these projects, Jim led the section 321 project that evaluated the water budget in hydrogeology for the San Pedro Basin and summarized findings in annual reports to Congress. A key aspect of this work was interpreting the wide variety of data collected and working with the Upper St. Pedro Partnership to assess progress towards sustainable withdrawals of groundwater. From 2007 to 2013, Jim served as the Center's Associate Director for Investigations. Currently, Jim is the Center Director of the Arizona Water Science Center. And we have Jeff today here. Uh, his research focuses on measuring and interpreting small changes in gravity as they relate to the hydro hydrology of alluvial basins in the southwestern U.S. Current projects focus on the hydrology of several areas in the lower Colorado River Basin, including aquifer storage assessments in the Phoenix area, the lining of All-American Canal, and previously environmental flood releases in the Colorado River Delta related to Minute 319. As a geophysics physics specialist at the Arizona Water Science Center, Jeff oversees the Southwest Gravity Program, a joint effort of the New Mexico and Arizona Water Science Centers to collect high quality, hydrologically useful, repeat microgravity data throughout the Western US. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, take it away. All right, thank you, Nemesis. Uh, let me just for confirmation, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good deal. Just want to make sure everything's working right. So, Nemesis, thanks for that introduction for all three of us. Really appreciate it. 
I also want to say thank you uh, to ADWR for hosting this series of brown bags, and thanks especially for inviting USGS to participate in it. Um, we really do appreciate it. So, and when I say us, I mean USGS, and you know specifically Jeff and Jeff and, and me in this case. Um, but I wanted to give just a, so I'm just doing like a little short intro section on kind of USGS and water science center and what we do. Jeff and Jeff are presenting the real science content. So I'll try to move through kind of quickly. Um, but just a little bit on the, you know, who us is um, when you invited us. So we are the uh, USGS Arizona Water Science Center. USGS is the Earth Science Wing of Department of Interior. And as an agency across the nation, we do a wide range of science from earthquakes to volcanoes to, you know, biology, and then water. So water is a part of what we do. Most of the science done in USGS uh, is actually done not so much at the headquarters, you know, Washington, D.C. level, but it's done in the field, um, in science centers. So there are, you know, over 100 USGS science centers, not all water-related, but that do a variety of science. So each state has a, a, a presence of a water science center in it. So in Arizona, we have the Arizona Water Science Center. And because we have um, our employees on the ground doing science, um, you know, out in the field, we have offices. We're headquartered in Tucson, and we also have offices in uh, in Yuma and Glendale and Flagstaff. So both Jeff and Jeff, for example, are from Flagstaff. I'm down here in Tucson. Um, the mission of USGS is is really to provide science based information that can help with resource management decision making. Um, we do some, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries, developing new science, and Jeff and Jeff are both going to talk to you about some of those efforts. But really, the intent of those, uh, you know, boundary pushing science development efforts is to help improve decision making in, in you know, now and in the future. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about having you know, offices around the state is that we're always trying to be engaged with stakeholders, with decision makers, um, and having, you know, presence around the state makes it easier for us to reach out and be in multiple places. So um, just briefly, um, we're divided into four sections. So we have a, a, our two biggest sections are related to science, a data section and a study section. Then we have a support section as well. Uh, let's see, pass the next slide, please. Um, just a short profile. So overall, we got about 70 employees. That includes students. We like to have an active population of students coming through. Um, that's where we get a lot of our workforce ultimately. Um, and you can see by these numbers that, you know, the biggest part of what we do is, is the science part, right? So we don't really manage any lands. We don't own lands. We don't have, you know, regulations. We just do science. So most of our employees are scientists. So in our investigation section, which is also our study section, uh, we got about 20 hydrologists, physical scientists, and geographers in the data section, uh, which focuses more on data collection. We've got um, over 30 hydrologic technicians, as well as some hydrologists and physical scientists. So most of our workforce is focused and the, on the science component of what we do. And going past the next slide. Yeah, so just a, you know, a little preamble. Um, USGS has a long history in Arizona that goes in, in, in some ways all the way back to Powell's original expeditions down the Colorado River and across the Colorado Plateau. Um, so Powell was part of a series of, of, of Western geologic expeditions uh, that were happening. He had the Colorado Plateau territory. His trips actually predated uh, the formation of USGS by about a decade, but uh, he was our second director and certainly things he uh, learned and experienced while he was out here uh, played right into the formation of USGS. So in some ways, USGS comes you know, right back to Arizona at its, at, its, at its very roots. It's a long history. Go ahead and move forward. So in uh, the water part of USGS, most people know us for our stream gauging network. It's probably our most visible um, component of the work, of work that we do. Uh, in Arizona, uh, Arizona Water Science Center, my center runs um, about 200 to 220 gauging stations, stream flow gauging stations. Um, this map shows where they are. They play a wide variety of, of, um, of purposes, uh, ranging from water supply, legal determinations, uh, flood warning purposes, uh, and we have technicians that go out and visit these gauges on a regular basis. They're out there, they're checking to make sure they work, they're doing measurements like you see in these pictures on the left um, to make sure that gauging network is providing the best information um, that it possibly can. And I don't have a pointer, but I'll point out because I'm going to bring it up a little later. Uh, the Lee's Ferry gauge, which is just right about Lake, Lake Powell in the, in the uh, upper center um, of the map. So right below Utah. Uh, go ahead and fast forward. So. There are a lot of water-related issues that drive our science, but you know, 
water has you know, many things that drive it. So currently we're entering their third decade of drought in Arizona. So I'll start with that. Um, so drought is one thing that drives a lot of what we do. So when we have drought, we have reduced stream flows. Reduced stream flows can result in a couple things. It can reduce, you know, can result in reduced water use, but it can also result in increased groundwater development. Um, so groundwater development is another issue that drives our science. Groundwater development can lead to things like fissuring and subsidence. Um, and then it can also lead to, to impacts to streams. So streams that are supplied by aquifers that flow into springs and flow into streams can be influenced by the groundwater removal um, in a basin. Um, so it's another part of what we do. Obviously in Arizona, mining is really important economically. Um, mining also has impacts. Mines need water to, to run. Uh, there are also water quality impacts that have to be mitigated. Um, and of course, it still floods in Arizona in spite of the drought. So when there are floods, we're out chasing the floods, uh, making the measurements. Um, part of what Jeff DiMedetto is going to be talking to you about are some innovative techniques using um, unmanned aerial systems, UAS, um, to do stream flow measurements. Part of what Jeff Kennedy is going to be talking about are this microgravity technique, which is an innovative way to look at groundwater uh, depletions or aquifer storage change. And of course, although we've been lucky for a couple of years, fires, I mean, there's always a, a um, a thing in Arizona that causes changes to watersheds, changes the amount of runoff, changes to water quality, and so on. Please go forward, Martin. Yeah, so in terms of some, just a few key capabilities, uh, I'm going to move fast. So you're going to hear uh, much more about the microgravity um, based analysis, which is what Jeff Kennedy is going to talk about. We do a lot of other geophysics, surface geophysical techniques, which help us look into the ground to see in the subsurface um, how water may be flowing, what's controlling water flow. Uh, we do a substantial amount of water quality monitoring as well as geochemical analysis. Uh, these next two, this continuous slope area and land surface surveying, uh, Jeff DiBenedetto is going to talk a bit about um, some of the surveying techniques using UAS. But these are ways of looking uh, at of measuring stream flow uh, creatively and flexibly uh, in response to these challenging systems we have in the Southwest where we have steep, flashy streams where flows come up, flows go back down very, very quickly, and they're hard to get to to actually measure. Uh, and then we do groundwater modeling. We have a, a water use assessment team uh, in which we work closely with ADWR um, to look at water use around the state. We have an active binational program. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned the stream flow monitoring. Go ahead and go forward. Hey, Jim, we're going to switch the optimization of WebEx so people can see what's written in the slide. It's going to take a couple seconds and then we'll move forward. Yeah, you bet. If you're all seeing what I'm seeing, it is a little fuzzy. Yeah, we're we're going to change it. It's optimized for video, so we'll optimize it for image. Much better. Okay, and then uh, just some of the major science activities. So we have an active transboundary program. Uh, we work actively with Mexico and with our neighboring states um, on what's called the Transboundary Aquifer Assessment Program. Um, there's also work along the Colorado River Delta called Minute 323. Uh, we have an active tribal program. We're working with tribes to assess water resources uh, so they have better knowledge uh, for water rights purposes, for water use purposes. Um, and then those last two really are what Jeff and Jeff are going to talk about, the stream flow monitoring piece and the microgravity assessment of groundwater resources. All right, flip forward one more. All right, if I can sneak this one in real quickly. Um, so if you um, um, are sad that March basketball is over, then you have an opportunity to extend it a little bit in kind of a silly way. So USGS headquarters devised this uh, National Competition of Stream Flow Gauges, and they picked four centers from around the country, Arizona, Idaho, uh, Maryland, D.C., and then California, to compete in this gauge competition, which has been more fun than it sounds like it should be. Each state got to pick out eight gauges. We had a, uh, a competition process. It's all done by Twitter voting. So all of these things were done by voting on Twitter. Last Friday, um, we had the semifinal, well, you know, kind of the last four, uh, where we had Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, which is the gauge I pointed out on that map, uh, against Bo Boise River, Twin Springs, Idaho, and the spray came, Lee's Ferry came out victorious. So on Wednesday, we go to the national competition, and we're going to be facing the Potomac River at Point of Rocks, Maryland. So there's kind of an epic east-west uh, battle for greatest gauge, which doesn't get you anything other than just the um, you know, bragging rights of greatest gauge. But if you're interested, uh, you can check out at uh, gauge or hashtag gauge greatness and at the Twitter handle, uh, twitter.com forward slash USGSAZ. 
and you can vote for uh, hopefully Lee's Ferry is the, uh, is the greatest gauge. Okay, with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Jeff DiMenedetto. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And uh, I think I'm the I'm the reason for all the um, video converting and and picture issues. So I've, I've been causing problems for the last two days here. Um, all right, so um, I've got a really cool job. I get to fly drones and discover new ways that we can study our rivers um, and try to implement new techniques for um, collecting scientific data. So I'm going to talk to you about that program. Next slide, please. So as you all you know, know flooding is dangerous. Um, working in rivers has inherent risk and working on floods is you know, very dangerous and risky. But part of our mission, as Jim talked about, we're charged with maintaining this relationship between stage or the depth of the river and discharge, how much water is moving downstream. And that information is used for, you know, anglers or people that want to boat on the rivers, um, but most importantly for flood management and advanced warning and also for infrastructure design. We need to build our bridges and roads uh, sufficient that it can withstand any sort of flooding that we regularly see. So how do we um, measure these rivers and maintain these relationships between stage and discharge that are always changing, um, but do it safely. So next slide, please. Part of what we're doing is changing the way we actually look at these rivers. And so um, getting on a river during a flood is dangerous and it's difficult um, logistically. And also some of our instrumentation might not work particularly well when these rivers flash and they're really sediment laden. So we are kind of, we're changing our view and by using UAS or drones and looking top down, we can gain some important information. Next slide. So these are just uh, a few of the systems that we use. Uh, we have a heavy lift multi-rotor aircraft that can lift about 10 pounds and also a whole lot of different sensors and then kind of a small medium lift and these little micro class. And we use these drone systems to survey, survey our river channels, to map large areas, and also to take video that we then use to profile uh, flood and flow events. Next slide. And so by putting an aircraft in the air and looking downward and collecting up to about a one minute video, we can actually measure discharge. We're using the video to measure velocity on the surface of the river. So direction and speed and distance of flow, as well as uh, correlating that to a cross-sectional area so we can get discharge. This allows um, our staff to stay off of bridges and off of roadways that are inherently dangerous. Um, and then collect data sets that are really short time exposure and um, kind of a shorter field exposure. And then so they can move on, because as we talked about, our flooding in Arizona often is um, induced either by rain on snow or monsoon effects, and they show up and leave very quickly. And so if we can get out and capture data and then move on to another site, we can profile large flood events as they move through a system and collect a lot of great data. Um, but sometimes that's difficult depending on the timing of the flooding. Next slide, please. So, because we still want to, even if we can't make it to the flood, a lot of that monsoon development happens late in the afternoon and then late in the evening, um, floods show up and can last 10 minutes, a few hours, a day. And we might not be able to get there in time to actually video and profile those flow velocities. Um, we can kind of do a forensics approach where we can get out and map the channels with our UAS systems and get 3D terrain as well as high resolution imagery of the flood effects. Next slide. So if we get, if the flood is, you know, providing enough seeding material, we can find these high water marks or flood lines and look at how much of the channel is inundated, the depth of that water, and we get this beautiful snapshot in time of some of the effects of the flow. Next slide, please. If we lay that over a terrain model, then we can plot where they are in space on the real land surface and um, and then model how much water came through and then maintain that stage discharge relationship at these peak at these peak events, as well as look at changes in our channel. And so we end up with this really robust data set that we can use into the future um, and collect quite rapidly. Next slide, please. When we compare 
the data to traditional ground surveying, you can see that the, um, the data pulled off of the drone imagery correlates really well with traditional survey methods. The benefit being we can cover really large areas quite quickly with a UAS system. We get a more robust imagery data set, as well as we're not exposing staff to uh, difficult field conditions. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of our, our streams don't see a whole lot of water, and then when they do, they see a lot really quickly. And in the meantime, a lot of animals take up residence in our rivers, so it's not uh, uncommon to see rattlesnakes and other critters in the tall grass when we're out there trying to find high water marks, as well as remnants of barbed wire fences and other things that create an exposure risk. So being able to use remote sensing techniques, um, we can actually minimize exposure and risk to our staff in, in ways even when the water's you know come and gone. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, so we get this robust data set yeah, that's this point in time, but if we keep those and then we keep going back to the same areas and surveying, we can look at change through time. And so we can look at rates of erosion, changes in river systems, really any sort of landform change if we can create comparative models. And so some of this is often used by the Department of Transportation and the Federal Highways Administration to manage roads and look at if they need to do things to bolster our infrastructure and harden string banks to protect our bridges. And so we can provide useful data to help them with that. Next slide, please. And we can do this in kind of a simple linear overlay technique, just looking at old data versus new data and measuring change that way. Next slide, please. Or we can do a more robust um, volumetric computation and look at how much material is moving and over time and give them estimates on how, how quickly things are changing so that they can make take the appropriate measures to get ahead of it and prevent damage to infrastructure, which has a huge uh, cost savings, not only in commerce, but just in for the taxpayers if they can prevent damage through time. And so this type of technique is also good for any sort of real landform change like um, subsidence and fissure creation and movement and anything we can measure as far as uh, volume and distance. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a small list of some of the tech or some of the ways we're using remote sensing and particularly drones um, in our river systems and kind of lots of applications for remote sensing. So that's that. Next slide. And then, yep, just questions, comments, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions. And here's a picture up in Flagstaff of our team after some training. And that's it for me. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Kennedy. Uh, my talk today is aquifer accounting for with repeat microgravity. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about my work at the USGS Arizona Water Science Center. Next slide. So the, the topic is aquifer accounting and in particular how we can measure aquifer storage. Um, groundwater storage or aquifer storage in some sense acts as a big underground storage tank and Arizona has really made that a, a pivotal part of their water planning. Um, most of the major cities in the state, certainly Phoenix and Tucson and the other Salt River Valley cities use underground storage extensively um, in some sense to bank water for future droughts. We've built up a, a surplus of water storage in our aquifers. Um, in some sense, aquifers act like a bank account where the, the balance or the amount in storage is affected by the, the amount of water coming in, balanced by the amount of water going out. In this uh, water cycle diagram on the screen there, uh, the inflows would be surface water inflow and streams, uh, recharge from precipitation, and groundwater inflow, or sometimes we call that subflow. The outflows would be pumping and evaporation, evapotranspiration um, and stream flow out of the area. Some of these are easy to measure like pumping and stream flow as Jeff was just talking about. Those are, are relatively easy to measure because we can, can see that water and have access to it. But the other components in particular recharge and evapotranspiration and groundwater subflow can be pretty difficult to, to measure directly. A lot of times these are, are estimated the best we can and then we're often trying to predict one component that's sort of the leftover amount of water that we can't account for otherwise. 
So it'd be really nice to have a, a method that would allow us to directly measure the changes in storage rather than having to, to estimate with a great deal of uncertainty all these other inflows and outflows. Next slide. Uh, at this point, you might be thinking, well, we can just measure groundwater level changes in wells to estimate aquifer storage, and we can, and we do. Um, wells are, are really useful, uh, especially like in this figure where we have a well open to the aquifer at, at different levels in the aquifer, or different elevations can teach us about how water moves vertically through the, the aquifer. But wells record groundwater head, or we call that the potentiometric surface. Um, which controls the direction that water moves in the aquifer. Um, so that's useful for something like groundwater modeling, but it, it's not so useful for estimating uh, the change in storage. Um, one reason is that they're expensive. Uh, they can be tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single well, which gives you good information about one location, but you can't just move that well to a new location as needed. You're really kind of stuck with it once you've installed it. Um, but maybe most importantly, we often don't know the aquifer storage coefficient. That's a, a parameter that lets us convert a change in head or a change in, in groundwater elevation to an amount of water. Um, it's essentially the porosity of the aquifer. So in this example, that, that black line in the plot shows about a 15 foot increase in water level, but we don't really know if that uh, corresponds to maybe an inch or two of water or maybe several feet of water if we don't know the, the aquifer storage coefficient or that, that porosity. So some of these limitations of wells have led towards the development of geophysical methods or hydrogeophysical methods, which essentially are, are methods deployed at the land surface that let us see into the subsurface. Next slide. One geophysical method I'm talking about today is called repeat microgravity. That simply means measuring changes in Earth's gravity over time. Uh, many of us probably know that Earth's gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, but that's just an average value over the entire Earth. As you go up in elevation, gravity decreases. Um, and it also changes with time due to a number of different factors, but the, the factor that we're interested in is, is of course, hydrology and, and groundwater storage. Um, this figure here on the screen shows the, the change in gravity due to recharge um, at one of Tucson Water's uh, basins at the, the Savsart facility in Avra Valley. Um, and we can see a, a big change and a, a rapid change in gravity when this basin is flooded, and then it rapidly decreases once the basin is dried out. Um, this is a, a huge change in terms of gravity, but at the same time, it's really just the, the seventh and eighth decimal places where we, we see that change. So we have these really sensitive instruments um, that allow us to, to measure these changes in gravity over time as they relate to groundwater storage. Next slide. Just one more uh, bit on the, the sort of technical background for this. Um, when we measure gravity or specifically changes in gravity, we can convert that, that change in gravity, which is really a change in acceleration. We convert that to a, a thickness of freestanding water. And this gets back to that other slide where instead of measuring head change in a well, we're actually measuring the amount of water that that head change corresponds to the, the freestanding water, similar to like in a, a pool or a bathtub maybe. So there's this direct conversion that doesn't depend on how deep the water table is or the aquifer porosity. It works in almost every situation. We can pretty simply take our, our change in, in acceleration and convert that to a thickness of water. Uh, there's very little that, very little else that goes into the analysis. Um, so if we make these gravity measurements at a well, where we're also measuring groundwater levels, we can use that combined data to estimate the, the aquifer porosity or the, the aquifer specific yield. It's really the, the only method that allows us to make a, a big area measurement of specific yield. So it's, it's useful in that regard, as well as for, for mapping aquifer storage changes. Next. So in terms of ma mapping aquifer storage change, it basically just means making measurements at a bunch of stations across the landscape. Uh, we work at the basin scale, which can either mean individual recharge basins of maybe a kilometer or so, but also the alluvial basin scale over several tens of kilometers, um, including maybe like the Salt River Valley in Phoenix or the, the Santa Cruz Valley in uh, Tucson. 
on the screen here, you see our, our relative and absolute gravity meters, the relative meters in the, the top right there, that gray box. It's really just a fancy spring. We measure the, the force exerted on a spring. The yellow meter there um, is called an absolute meter, and it's actually got a vacuum chamber, and it's measuring the acceleration of a falling mass inside that vacuum chamber. So it's a, a direct measurement of the acceleration due to gravity. Um, we use them together. They each have their um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, but fundamentally, they require a stable measurement location. Oftentimes, that's a well pad. You can see several wells in the photo there. But essentially, we need some sort of concrete or solid surface. And in some projects, um, that, that's the bulk of the effort is establishing a new network. Sometimes we have to create these monuments. Um, oftentimes, permission to build monuments can be an issue. Next slide. Uh, so moving along into some case studies of mapping aquifer storage change, uh, starting in Tucson, a lot of what we do began in the 1990s with the efforts of Don Poole and others at USGS and also at the university there to develop this method. In fact, um, Errol Montgomery, who founded maybe one of the larger uh, consulting firms in the state, um, did his PhD dissertation on the microgravity method to measure specific yield, really one of the first uh, references uh, to do so. But in this slide, we're looking at gravity change at, at SAVSARP, again, a, a recharge facility operated by uh, Tucson Water. And the, the bottom two maps show the gravity change following a recharge cycle. So we're looking at the, the dissipation of a, a groundwater mound. Um, you can see storage increases away from the basins, but decreases directly below the basins as that, that groundwater mound dissipates. Um, a pretty straightforward example here, but I think it pretty conclusively demonstrates that we can can map these storage changes using the, the microgravity method. Next slide. Another project of ours in Tucson um, is concerned with the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project, where Tucson Water is putting uh, reclaimed effluent into the, the Santa Cruz River um, to, to store it for potential future use. We've got several dozen stations um, along the river. Uh, I should point out that the Tucson projects are all um, managed by a, a colleague, Libby uh, Wildermuth, um, as uh, spearhead of this project and others in Tucson. Uh, for this particular one, one of the things of interest are the, the water quality sites in orange there. Um, these are contaminated groundwater sites. And there's some concern with sufficient recharge may um, inundate and mobilize contaminants in some of these sites. So that's one of the things we're, we're tracking with the, the repeat gravity measurements. Another project in Tucson is at the South Houghton uh, recharge project where there are some newly constructed recharge basins. And that is really the first project we've had where we've gotten in on the ground floor to make measurements before they start recharge. So we're, we're looking at some interesting results to, to come out of that. Next slide. Another project I'm interested in is in Albuquerque. We started measurements there in 2016, and that's a, a pretty interesting story where they uh, transitioned from primarily groundwater to primarily surface water for their, their drinking water supply. And initially in the first three years or so, we saw widespread increases in storage throughout the basin as they, they pumped a lot less groundwater. But beginning in about 2019, um, the, the situation's kind of reversed. They're starting to pump more. And we're really seeing more variable or maybe a decrease in storage in some areas. Um, the map on the right shows storage change last winter, uh, December to April. So we see kind of widespread decreases, but a few focused increases in storage where they do recharge. One of them is an in-channel recharge project you see in that photo there. Um, and another one is uh, an injection well recharge project. And we do see the increases in storage from these projects in the gravity data. But they're pretty localized. They don't really, that recharged water doesn't make it very far beyond the, the areas where it, it's recharged. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves going forward. We also see a really good correlation with the um, uh, pumping. We have information about their, their pumping volumes and locations, and that really corresponds well with the gravity data, more so than it corresponds with the, the water level data. We can measure the, the changes better with with gravity than we can with water levels. Next slide. 
Finally, in uh, Phoenix, we've got a relatively new project there in the North Phoenix well field. That map shows uh, the 101 freeway at the south, carefree highway at the north. We've got about 100 stations. And so far, we, we don't see much change, especially change related to the, the pumping. They, they're not really using the, the well field too much. Um, their primary, primary water supplies are, are surface water supplies from the, the Central Arizona project and, and Salt River. But going forward, in anticipation of potential uh, reductions in particular Colorado River supplies, they may be doing much more pumping in this well field in the future. So we've sort of established this, this baseline network. And we're interested to see how it evolves in the future. This particular network consists of about 100 stations, and it takes us about three weeks to observe. We just do it uh, once per year. Next slide. All of these projects, the, the Tucson, Phoenix, Albuquerque, and others fall under what we call the Southwest Gravity Program. This is sort of an informal effort by Arizona and California and New Mexico to develop this repeat microgravity method into really an, an operational method that we can deploy efficiently and at a large number of locations. Sort of our unique capabilities with the, the gravity program is absolute gravimetry. That's the uh, yellow absolute gravity meter I showed you. Uh, there's really just a handful of those throughout the world, and we're um, practically the only ones in the, the U.S. that are doing this type of work with an absolute gravity meter. But also, we, we do these projects routinely. Um, there are other groups that do repeat microgravity in the country, but a lot of times they're sort of one-off specific projects. Uh, we feel we've really developed the sort of start to finish field methods and data archiving and processing and publication that allows us to take on a large number of projects and complete them efficiently. I should point out that ADWR also has a large active uh, repeat microgravity program under uh, Brian Conway. Um, they've got large networks in the Salt River Valley and Pinal County. We work with them quite closely, uh, both in data collection and um, interpretation, but um, it's great for both of us, I think, to have another group, uh, another local group doing the, the same type of work. Uh, finally, all, all of this work is supported by our many uh, cooperators and, and partners throughout the region. Uh, for these projects, the city of Tucson and Tucson Water and the city of Phoenix and their water services department and Albuquerque Bernalino County Water Utility Authority have all been great supportive partners over the years, helping to develop the method, as well as a number of other partners throughout the, the region in California. Okay. Next slide. If you're interested, um, here's a, a few references for you. In particular, that fact sheet um, has a fairly non-technical overview of the method and some other um, highlights from, from recent projects um, and just some other reports you might be interested in. If you want to drop me an email, I'm happy to share these with you directly. Um, or if you find the presentation, there's some, some links there for you. Next slide. That's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much again. Thanks to ADWR for, for hosting this webinar. I look forward to seeing the other ones in the future. Uh, there's my email. Like I said, feel free to, to drop me a, a message for, for more information, or there's a, a link to our complete bibliography there on the bottom. Um, I think that's it for USGS. I think we're all happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Nemesis. Thank you very much, Jeff Benedetto, Jeff Kennedy, and Jim Leanhout for your presentations. And thank you for your continuous collaboration with ADWR. We truly appreciate all your, the work that you do. And these presentations were really amazing and the work that you do is awesome. Um, there is definitely time for questions. We have about, the time is set for one hour, so 20 minutes are left. If there are any questions, and I see one in the chat. So I'll be reading questions for you guys and feel free to answer them. Let's see. So we have a question here. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, it's not opening for me. Can someone open the questions for me? There you go. Okay. So question is. Weren't there stations around the Verde and San Pedro? Are there are they no longer being monitored? They look like grayed out triangles. 
Yeah, hi, Tricia. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, you're correct. Yeah, we did have had projects in the Verde and San Pedro. Um, the flip side of having cooperators and partners all over is that when partners decide they want to stop monitoring, we generally don't have funding to continue it on ourselves. And that's what's happened in both of those projects. They've just been discontinued essentially due to lack of funding. Um, but that's one of the big advantages of this gravity method is we can essentially pick them up at any time. Um, we don't depend on any sort of continuity between surveys, so we could certainly repeat um, any stations in the San Pedro or, or elsewhere to uh, get an updated snapshot of storage change. I think the last San Pedro survey was in 2015, but I, I think it would be worthwhile to, to do another one down there. Thank you. Um, there's another question from James Taylor. I saw that habitat monitoring was mentioned as an application for the surface imaging technology. Very interesting. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Sure, thanks James. Um, so really anything that we can look at through time, we can potentially assess change. And so not only do we uh, fly color cameras, we're able to fly infrared cameras and look at vegetation health and productivity. And if we team up with a capable biologist, they can even get down to species identification, potentially off of um, those infrared signatures. And then we can also, we also use thermal cameras and, and look at heat signature and reflected heat also. So um, with repeat modeling, um, especially within river systems, we can look at um, migration of sandbars, get into some volume changes, how banks are um, eroding. And then um, what we usually do, because we like to focus, we're focusing on the remote sensing and physical change. Um, and we do hydraulic modeling, but often, for habitat monitoring, we'll work with uh, fish biologists and riparian biologists and ecologists and start looking at how those changes might be affecting habitat for particular fish species, how that might affect spawning and projects like that. So lots, lots of utility there, um, but it's, it's a collaborative process for sure. Thank you. We have another question from Doug McEachran to Jeff Benedetto. From your description, it looks like the use of drones has really made a significant difference in the ability of USGS to measure water volume, distance, soil erosion, and the other things that you measure. Is enhanced productivity the biggest difference? Um, wow, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, so, you know, we, uh, there's, there's with any sort of technology advance, there's a lot of hurdles um, just from file formats and file sizes and all that kind of stuff. There's lots of things to consider and um, and kind of prepare for because we're functionally we're still boiling down to a relationship between stage and discharge. And so, um, yeah, productivity is is um, a potential benefit though there's a little bit more there's less field time and a little bit more analysis in the office and so there's definitely trade-offs um we we inherently value our own data sets and we try to um basically make our, our method our methodology translates all the way back to the beginning of when we started measuring rivers and so um the information that we're providing isn't necessarily changing just the means by which we can collect it is is changing a little bit and so but yeah there's there's quite a few differences um, just in um, the ability to fly a system. We, we need to maintain a commercial UAS pilots license and then have certifications through the Department of Interior in order to fly, which includes regular flying and proficiency and safety plans and all kinds of stuff. So there's a, there's a lot that gets tacked onto that employee's uh, workload in order to actually get out and collect those data sets. Jeff, if I could just jump in real quick and add to that, you already brought up the safety component, right? It's dangerous to put people out on bridges during floods and dangerous to put them on cableways because you got trees and whatnot floating by. And the other thing is we can put a drone up in a place and get a flood measurement where we don't have a bridge and we don't have a cableway, right? So a place you could never do a direct measurement by wading the river, you, you can do a drone and actually get a measurement. So, you know, expands the number of places we can go and get measurements to. Thank you. That is definitely very convenient for data collection. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Justin Clark. 
Uh, Jeff Benedetto, how do the results compare to FEMA estimated floodplains and recharges? Will FEMA eventually use the USGS methods? Um, so we aren't directly comparing to FEMA. Um, so if if FEMA wants to use our data, they are 100% more than welcome. It's all publicly available and um, archived and produced that way. There is some interest uh, currently from FEMA in using some of our methods to measure high water marks and profile floods after the fact and and get those types of data sets. And so um, we we are basically trying to show that the methods work and then do quality assurance analysis on that so that we can compare it to traditional standards and then have a good feel of where the trade-offs are so that those people such as or organizations like FEMA or flood control districts can evaluate what's the best tool for their needs. And so, um, but there is some interest in moving to a more uh, remote sensing and technology-based approach for measuring and monitoring flood inundation and uh, those types of things. Thank you. And we have one more question for you uh, from mm -hmm. Faith Shelton. Are there any reports that you've worked on with the drones and flood mapping velocity, et cetera, that you recommend? Um, oh, my gosh. Um, yes, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, is there a way I can uh, after afterwards provide some links to reports or interesting, interesting oh, definitely. To review? Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll grab a handful of of things if you want to read some journal articles on on these techniques and um, how they're being used and and kind of bigger ideas. And if people have additional questions, they could also send you emails. We have them in the presentation slides, and we'll share the video. There are a couple more questions, and we do have time for them. So for Jeff Kennedy. Apart from groundwater monitoring and depth to bedrock study studies, are there any other major applications using gravity sur gravity surveying? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, what I talked about was repeat microgravity, but there's a another way to use gravity that's really just analyzing a, a static image or the, the static gravity field, um, which is the the question implies is used for depth to bedrock studies or other geologic studies, like looking for, for faults. Um, there's a whole world of repeat microgravity uh, applications using continuous sensors that I just barely covered. The instruments we generally use are intended for periodic surveys, like once every few months or once a year. But there's another type of instrument you basically plug into the wall and it just sits in one location and records and those are useful for all sorts of um, earth structure type survey earth studies looking at um like the earth's inner core or seismology type surveys um they're used in astronomy for various purposes uh also to look at earth tides which is the deformation of the solid earth in response to other planets other planetary bodies um, so, yeah, there, there's a whole lot. The issue we come up with again and again, maybe related to the next question, is the instruments are all really expensive. We're, all, we're always limited in terms of buying new instruments and, and what we can do um, only having the, the instrumentation that we have. Um, so, yeah, lots of, lots of interesting projects out there. I'll just mention real briefly, we do land-based work, but some of you may have heard of the GRACE satellite mission, which measures gravity change from space. In some ways, it's identical to what we do. In other ways, it's completely different because they're measuring over a several hundred kilometer pixel. Maybe Arizona is one or two or three pixels. So you get one average storage change value for the whole state, which I don't think is very useful for, for water management. Um, so yeah, that, that's another application. You've got terrestrial and space-based. Um, unfortunately, not really anything in between. It's not really feasible to put a gravity meter on a on a drone. Thank you. And we have uh, another one for Jeff, Jeff or Jim. If you could receive a wish list improvement to your programs, what would that be? Where do you see uh, your programs going in the next few years? And thank you for the presentations. So, uh, Jeff Kennedy, you already kind of answered that question, but is there anything else that you would want to add to that? 
Um, there's a whole lot going on in terms of instrument development, new technologies that we're not really involved with too much. I think our fundamental problem is the instrumentation. Most other geophysical methods, the fundamental problem is the interpretation. You don't need better data. You just need better interpretation methods, but we need better data. Um, so both being able to purchase instruments that exist today, but also new instruments that may come in the future are both important, I think. Cool, thanks, Jeff. And then Jeff DiBenedetto, do you have anything you wanna add into that? Um, yeah, my, you know, it's all in the same vein. It's um, access to equipment and um, technology. We've really, uh, the UAS program in general has really uh, benefited from the autonomous car industry. Strangely enough, it's all about miniaturization of sensors. And so um, we've been able to adapt and work with companies that will put laser LIDAR scanners um, that we're putting them on cars for autonomous cars that we're now adapting to drone systems and we can fly them around and create, do aerial LIDAR scans and get just fantastic terrain models. Um, and even with vegetation in our channels, it's been really helpful. That said, they're really expensive and um, the drone systems we use are uh, they're re regulated by the Department of Interior and they're treated by the US government as actual aircraft like any other airplane, and which is why we maintain commercial pilots licenses to fly. And so our access to equipment is a little bit limited. And um, so that that wish list would be, you know, access to the newest, greatest thing out there, um, but also access to more utilitarian um, platforms to to move our sensors around and collect the data we want. Um, so it's all it's all coming along, but it's um, you know we always want it faster. And so yeah, that would be it. Thank you. Another well, question. If I could just add a quick Sorry, twist on that, real quick. Um, so I agree with everything Jeff and Jeff said. I guess the twist I would put on it is, you know, I said at the beginning that um, we produce this information for use for water resource management decision making. So. You know, in, in, in kind of increasing the, um, uh, the the uses of this information, um, increasing the dialogue with stakeholders, that helps us fine tune kind of what we do and where we push these techniques. Um, you know, so for me, the vision of it is really you know making sure these things are being used fully uh, to the extent that they can provide information that's useful for the decision making process. Thank you. And then one more question popped up from Brian Conway. Would the USGS consider cost sharing on the purchase of an A10 to be used by both the USGS and ADWR? Yes. <laughs> the answer is Say yes. yes, Jim. <laughs> Say yes. We would. Um, I think we want what is it called? An RQ something or other. The Global Hawk Predator Reaper. That's that's the way to go. I mean, as much as I'd like to fly an A10. <laughs> <laughs> that's the A10 yeah. Warthog popped up. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's another way of doing, you know, drone measurements. But yeah, I mean, we absolutely would. I would I, logistically, I don't know how that would work, but um, you know, like Jeff Kennedy said, these instruments are expensive. I, I mean, the one we have now is about sixteen years old. So if you divide the number of measurements made by the cost of it, it's maybe not all that expensive, you know, kind of on a per measurement basis. But there's a lot of capital invested in it, so we are always looking for ways uh, and opportunities to cost share instrumentation because uh, that's you know really. I think Jeff would agree with me that right now the gravity program is really equivalent limited, right? We only have the one A10. It can only be so many places, you know, sometimes it needs repair and things like that. So short answer, yeah, I'm not quite sure how it works, but we can we can talk. If I could add um to avoid any confusion, the A the A10 is the name of the absolute gravity meter that we use and is also an airborne platform. <laughs> um but yeah, as Jim mentioned, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think we're getting closer to buying a second one, but that's a constant problem is the, the capital cost up front to buy these instruments. Thank you. <laughs> um, if, is there anyone in the chat that would like to unmute themselves and ask another question or have any comments that they would like to share? Okay, thank you everyone. And thank you, Jeff, Jeff and Jim for your presentations. Um, thank you all who joined us today. If there's anyone interested in checking out last year's Water Awareness Month webinars, uh, they are on the ADWR, ADWR YouTube webpage and I'll share the link soon. Um, and the celebration is not over yet. We have um, 
a webinar tomorrow from our EPA WaterSense partner, Tara O'Hare. She will talk about WaterSense labeled products from your, for your home, yard, and business. And we have quite a few different webinars throughout the month. We encourage you all to check them out. And let's all celebrate and protect our water resources every day. I will also add to the chat the Arizona Water Facts uh, website where you will find a lot of information about Arizona water resources and events throughout the state. Um, have a good, a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. We appreciate being invited. Thanks all. Bye-bye.